This company was once the king of Silicon Valley. It's turning up everywhere, and a chance of a better quality of life depends essentially on this little thing. From pioneering the first microprocessor to defining the architecture of personal computing, Intel's rise to dominance was nothing short of legendary. For decades, its processors powered the digital dreams for billions, earning it a reputation as the undisputed leader of chip manufacturing. But what was once a most valuable U.S. chip maker is now 1 16th the size of NVIDIA by market cap. Again, I'm going to tell people, no. He's been an underperformer. No. Maybe that's putting it polite. You, you, you don't want to buy it. What seems to unfold in a few consecutive quarters of bad earnings are actually decades in the making. So how did Intel go from powering the digital world to losing its edge in semiconductor manufacturing to its rivals? In this video, we'll dive into Intel's meteoric rise to power, what went wrong, and what is next for the semiconductor company. To truly understand Intel's incredible rise, we must start at the beginning, or start small, with the transistor. Developed in 1947 by physicists John Bardeen, Walter Bertain, and William Shockley at Bell Labs. A transistor is a semiconductor device that acts as a switch or an amplifier for electronic signals. By replacing bulky and unreliable vacuum tubes with a smaller, more efficient, and durable alternative, computers could become smaller and cheaper. For context, the first transistorized computers from 1953 had around 92 transistors. CPUs today have over 10 billion. A transistor's ability to control and amplify electrical currents makes them essential components in virtually all modern electronic devices. And in 1968, a small company in Mountain View, California, was about to make an enormous history-altering achievement in the world of computers. Intel was founded in 1968 by Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore in Mountain View, California as NM Electronics. The name was changed to Integrated Electronics, Intel, officially a few months later in 1968. Intel began its journey with a simple yet bold goal, to make semiconductor memory more affordable, smaller, and accessible to the everyday consumer. Both Noyce and Moore left Fairchild Semiconductor pioneer in transistors and circuit manufacturing to start their own company in Silicon Valley. Fun fact, Jerry Sanders also worked at Fairchild Semiconductor. Inspired by Noise and Moore, he left Fairchild in 1969 to found AMD, or Advanced Micro Devices. Much more on them later. In 1971, Intel achieved their goal by introducing the world's first commercially available microprocessor, the Intel 4004 created by Frederico Fagan, Ted Hoff, and Stanley Miser, originally designed for a Japanese calculator company called Busycom. The Intel 4004's development marked a pivotal moment in the history of computing, as it made it possible to create smaller, more powerful, and affordable electronic devices. The 4004 was made of polysilicon rather than metal, which was an innovative idea at the time. This allowed transistors and components to be much closer together compared to being made on metal, which created much more space for even more transistors on the chips. Intel was able to fit 2,300 transistors on the new polysilicon chips, greatly increasing speed while lowering power consumption. So you would think that one of the most influential achievements in the history of mankind would have been Intel's top priority. However, that would not be the case. Resources at Intel were limited, and the company was mostly focused on making memory chips to make a profit. The 4004 was an understaffed side project that began in April 1969, and the two main engineers on the project, Ted Hoff and Stanley Miser, were not even chip designers. It wasn't until Frederico Fagan came on board a year later that the 4004 was officially designed. By allowing computers to become smaller, while simultaneously being able to do larger calculations meant the Intel coin name Mini Computer, soon to be known to the world as the Personal Computer, was on the brink of its debut. And with that, Intel's rise as the dominant force, and for most consumers, the only force in the CPU market. In 1981, the Personal Computer came into its own, but the launch of the IBM PC 
the brains running the IBM PC was the new Intel 8088 chip. Released in 1979, the 8088 chip was 50 times faster than the 4004 and had 29,000 transistors. For Intel, this chip and its previous variant, the 8086, started the x86 architecture that almost every CPU is based on today. Even today, the fastest supercomputer in the world, the Frontier, has CPUs based on the x86 architecture. The 8088 is the much more famous and successful CPU thanks to IBM. In the late 1980s to early 90s, thanks to the personal computer boom, Intel had begun its unprecedented 10-year growth as the main CPU supplier in the PC industry. Thanks to its immense success with IBM, Intel knew how to make winning combinations with other companies. And in the 1990s, Intel saw an even greater rise to success with its Wintel combination of Microsoft Windows and Intel processors. The combination of the two made the PC industry more affordable, smaller, and accessible to the everyday consumer. Even after all this incredible success, Intel didn't reach the peak of its rise until 1993 with the development and production of the Pentium microprocessors, with the Pentium processor being the first of its kind. With an extraordinary amount of total transistors, numbering at 3.1 million, Pentium became Intel's flagship processor line for over 10 years and was Intel's most advanced chip up until that date. But now, Intel had a new tactic, a marketing campaign. Intel Inside. This symbol outside. Says inside you'll find a lasting commitment to performance. With this new marketing campaign, the entire world knew about Intel and how important their microchips were. The marketing campaign gave Intel something it didn't have before, brand recognition. People mostly knew computers by their main developers, like IBM and Apple. But with the Intel Inside campaign, people began to recognize Intel as an important brand that they had to have and only purchase PCs with Intel CPUs inside. Intel had become a household name. Of course, the title of this video would be much different if Intel had only risen and stayed there. What comes up must come down. Remember way back in the beginning of the video when we had a fun fact related to Jerry Sanders and his company, AMD? Well, they're back in our story now, ready to take the market from Intel. Beginning in the early 2000s, growth in demand for high-end microprocessors slowed, brought about by the bursting of the dot-com bubble in 2000 and the Japanese recession in the late 90s. However, AMD, still the underdog in the microprocessor world, began taking up more market share thanks to AMD focusing much more on low-end and mid-range processors compared to Intel. During the 80s and 90s, AMD was little more than a second source manufacturer for Intel. Thanks to a 10-year technology exchange agreement, both companies signed in 1982. However, the door was open for AMD thanks to Intel's complacency, starting with the microprocessor's chipset Coppermine, which thanks to a memory issue, cost Intel over $253 million to recall and sullied Intel's reputation. AMD capitalized on this blunder with the development and shipment of the K7 chip, also known as Athlon. The new AMD Athlon processor! Many people don't know it's a faster PC processor than Pentium 3 at any clock speed. The K7 chip was more reliable and less expensive than Intel's chips, and so AMD was able to claim a spot in the low-end and consumer-end market for CPUs. If you think opening the door for your greatest competitor is bad, then missing out on one of the greatest technological products in human history is much, much worse. The late Steve Jobs came to then Intel CEO Paul Ottolini about a new handheld device that could do anything a computer could do. The iPhone was still in development, and Jobs needed a processor that had the speed of a PC CPU but used less energy since a phone would run off battery power. Intel, at the time, thought the iPhone would be more of a niche product, and Steve Jobs said that Intel was slow. During negotiations, the two companies could not agree on terms, like who owned the intellectual property of the CPUs and a specific price for the chips Intel would design. In the end, the deal never materialized and Apple moved on to Samsung to make their chips. Samsung used a new CPU architecture designed and developed by ARM, 
these new ARM chips solved Apple's issue of using less power, but worse for Intel. ARM design chips were a direct competition of Intel's x86 chip architecture. Thanks to being part of the iPhone, ARM-based chips quickly improved due to the large manufacturing volumes, and every new smartphone developer needed them for their phones. Apple then started placing massive orders with Taiwanese Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, or TSMC, to build its iPhone chips, leaving Intel once again having to catch up. Apple's large orders provided the cash to annually upgrade the manufacturing equipment at TSMC, which eventually surpassed Intel in high-end microprocessor manufacturing. Once again, Intel had opened the door to competition, which has been a running theme for Intel since the start of the new millennium. Beginning in 2021, Intel has been pouring money into research and development to help compete with ARM and TSMC. Nicknamed Intel's Death March by their own CEO, Intel has spent over $8 billion last year alone to help upgrade and construct new facilities to produce microprocessors with a plan to eventually spend $100 billion across four U.S. states. This potential growth will help Intel in the foundry business, which may be what Intel wants to become. Instead of competing with TSMC's 2NM microchip process, Intel may become what AMD was in the 80s and early 90s, a second source microprocessor manufacturer. Of course, this spending spree does have its short-term effects. With so much money being spent on upgrading and construction, this has negatively affected Intel's balance sheets, hurting its stock price and creating uncertainty if the incredibly large gambles will even pay off. Intel does have some respite, with the help of government subsidies totaling around the $30 billion range. Intel could get a much needed boost in its production line. However, these government subsidies have also been awarded to TSMC. Last but not least could be the next greatest technological product in human history, AI. Intel is once again playing catch up to other companies, especially the one leading the AI revolution, NVIDIA. 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 In NVIDIA stock. Generative AI is being run by extremely advanced GPUs, or graphics processor units. Originally developed to play high-end video games, GPUs are the most important part of AI, and necessary to make an enormous amount of calculations in seconds. Companies are beginning to spend their money on GPUs instead of CPUs, turning to NVIDIA to make their GPU-centric servers. We see from all the big tech firms, they're pouring 10 or so billion dollars a year each quarter into building out their data center capacity, and the lion's share of that money is going to NVIDIA. To make matters worse for Intel, NVIDIA announced Blackwell. 208 billion transistors, this is Blackwell. A GPU that is being matched with ARM-based CPUs, not the x86 CPU architecture. Intel's only competitive product to Blackwell is their Gaudi 3 AI Accelerator, which Intel has stated is not a GPU. Whether or not Gaudi 3 can compete with Blackwell remains to be seen, since both AI chips are not out yet. Intel was once the king of Silicon Valley. Its incredible achievements in microprocessors can never be overstated. Our world has been completely changed thanks to Intel. But like every empire in human history, there is a rise and a fall. Will Intel be able to rise again and change the world like it did in the past? From the words of current Intel CEO, Pat Gilsinger, when I look at Intel, I see limitless potential. This company continues to evolve, but one thing remains constant. We're just getting started. Thank you for watching this video. We hope you learned something and enjoyed listening. Check out our next video about NVIDIA, where we talk about how they started as a company that helped make video games look better to being worth $2 trillion. And we'll see you in the next one. Don't forget to smash that like button.